Good morning. Uh, Father Chad has asked me to address you today and tomorrow on themes relating to sacrifice. I've done some research in this area and I wrote a book uh, called Welcoming Gifts. And of course, it's very relevant to our Lenten struggle, this idea of sacrifice. And I hope to uh, provoke some thought, maybe shed a little light on this sacrifice of repentance that we're engaging in. My first reflection today is entitled, Finding a Home in Sacrifice. In today's world, we find ourselves profoundly dislocated and disconnected. On one hand, most of us can expect relocation from city to city many times throughout our lives, uprooting us from community after community, straining our relationships and reducing our neighborhood to a piece of geographic trivia rather than the support network it once was. On the other hand, technology provides us ever more convenient yet shallow ways to connect to people. From phone calls to text messages to tweets to social media posts and likes, we reach out to one another more and more often with less and less substance and depth. Thus, it becomes harder and harder for us to develop deep relationships resulting in social fragmentation and polarization alongside personal loneliness and isolation. Just as we feel alienated from one another, we may also feel alienated from God. This is nothing new. It goes back to Adam and Eve's shame, their hiding from God and their exclusion from paradise. This spiritual alienation is an exile from God and is so poignantly expressed in Psalm 136. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. In this Psalm, the exiles of Israel lament their separation from Zion it is no accident that we sing this psalm in preparation for our great Lenten journey of repentance. For this experience of exile from the city of God is our great spiritual predicament, and such a longing as they express to be home with God is our motivation for the difficult work of repentance ahead of us. Lent is our return as exiles across the intervening deserts of spiritual isolation to our homeland with God. It is the embarrassed yet hopeful walk of the prodigal son to the awaiting father. We long for such a spiritual home, a place of belonging, nurture, and safety with God, where we can also belong to one another, care for one another, and be cared for. This is what we mean by the word communion, communion with God and in him with one another. And there is a particularly beautiful image of this communion that we long for in Psalm 83. This Psalm provides perhaps a hopeful answer to the bitter lament of those exiles by the waters of Babylon. Whereas there they seem to despair of their lost home with God, the psalmist here discovers an unexpected, extraordinary possibility of renewing that home with him. I will quote four verses at the beginning of that psalm. Again, it's Psalm 83 in the Septuagint. How beloved are thy dwellings, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs and faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh have rejoiced in the living God. For even a sparrow found a nest, sorry, even a sparrow found a house for itself, and a turtle dove a nest for itself, in which to lay its young. Thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in thy house. They will praise thee unto ages of ages. 
For many years, this image of the bird nesting in the altar has warmed my heart as a symbol of profound familiarity or at-homeness with God. I imagine the psalmist in the temple courtyard noticing a little bird tending her young in the midst of the solemnity and spectacle of Old Testament worship. As beautifully robed priests stand in the midst of stately buildings and skilled choirs sing and trumpets sound, this man's eye is on a gaggle of tiny mouths crying out for the bits of worm that their mother has brought back for them. He sees them nestled in some crevice of the monumental stone altar, which none but the priests dare approach, and even they approach with fear. Yet this sacred and imposing meeting place with God is made cozy by the twigs, straw, and feathers that the mother has arranged in its wall for her little ones. The psalmist is struck by the bird's sense of safety and comfortability and finds in this homey image a way perhaps to ground himself amidst the grandiosity of ritual happening around him. It is a vision of a life-giving connection with God that brings us together in his care. It is a vision, in fact, of the goal of those rituals of worship going on around this nest. That is, to make the people at home with God. The psalmist says, How beloved are thy dwellings, O Lord of hosts. The temple was meant to be the dwelling place of God, his house among the people of Israel. It was not built for God's sake, for, as Solomon said at its dedication, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. God needs no dwelling place, but mankind needs his presence with us. Therefore, the Lord said to Moses in Exodus, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. The Lord then invited the people of Israel to meet him there on a regular basis. He established purifications to prepare them for his presence and rituals to choreograph their approach to him. He appointed feasts throughout the year as a sort of homecoming gathering as many of the people as possible to, into fellowship with him at regular intervals. Yet although this system was founded to bring the people into communion with God and with one another, we all know how liturgy sometimes takes on a life of its own. It can get untethered from its essential purpose, and the goal of fostering communion can be eclipsed by rote performance. So here in this psalm, the heart and essence of temple worship is reasserted, as the psalmist proclaims, Blessed are those who dwell in thy house. Blessed are the gathered worshipers, because like the little birds in that nest, thou wilt care for them, and they will dwell together in safety. And again, they will praise thee unto ages of ages, squawking their affections to the Lord, who is like a mother bird, shelter them, sheltering them under her wings. We have here a beautiful renewal of the heart of worship. However, one key piece of context is still missing from this interpretation. The altars mentioned in this psalm were not merely a place of worship, but specifically a place of sacrifice. In particular, the altar in which the turtle doves nest and, and lay their young was a place where turtle doves, along with other animals, were sacrificed. This species of bird, the turtle dove, was one of only two kinds of birds that could be offered upon the altar, according to the law. Therefore, we cannot ignore this ritual of sacrifice implied by the altar as we seek to understand this image. 
A turtle dove nests and lays its young in a place where turtle doves were sacrificed. This added detail certainly complicates the psalm's imagery. It places the nest in the middle of, uh, shall we say, earthy and potentially disturbing procedure. The turtle doves brought for sacrifice were carried alive to the side of the altar. They were then wrung by the neck and decapitated. Their bodies were pressed against the wall of the altar in order to drain out their blood upon it. Finally, their carcasses were split open and placed upon the altar fire to be burned. This is now a much more complicated image indeed. On one hand, we have the nurturing nest. On the other, the bloody slaughter. It is tempting to simply dismiss the unpleasantness and cling to that naive and comforting vision of a spiritual home, to unring the bell, so to speak, and return to our romanticized vision of a nest and happy birdies in a non-functioning altar. However, as tempting as that might be for us today, the ancient hearers of the scripture seemed unfazed by this juxtaposition. The ancient Jewish tradition of interpretation as represented in the Targum of the Psalms points toward a synthesis of nest and sacrifice. I'll read for you its interpretive paraphrase of this verse, but maybe first I'll remind you of the, the original text. The original text, uh, for even a sparrow found a house for itself and a turtle dove a nest for itself in which to lay its young, thine altars, O Lord of hosts. And now the Targum, an interpretive paraphrase. Even the dove has found a house and the turtle dove a nest that is suitable for its hatchlings to be sacrificed on your altars, O Lord Sabaoth, my king and my God. In this reading, sacrifice is not just the context of the nest, but also its purpose. The hatchlings are born at the altar in order to be sacrificed upon it. And this is the most suitable home for them to be born into. The altar of sacrifice, an altar for them to be sacrificed upon is the most suitable nest for them. A complicated context, a puzzling image, an intriguing targum. At this point, one might shift toward a historical, literary, and academic analysis of this text. However, here at the start of Great Lent, I submit that this perplexing juxtaposition is a prime occasion for devotional reflection. Nest and sacrifice. On one hand is the home, the communion with God that we all long for. On the other is the sacrifice, that rending, emptying work by which we reach out to God. They cannot be separated, but how do they fit together? First of all, sacrifice cultivates communion with God. The altar of sacrifice provides the most suitable spiritual nesting place for us. As I said before, for the ancient Jews, the temple was a place of meeting with God, his home on earth. The rituals of sacrifice were the means of facilitating this meeting. They were a procedure for fostering communion with God, making God and mankind at home with one another. In our next session, we'll talk more about how these rituals of sacrifice were meant to accomplish this goal. But suffice it to say here that the killing, dismembering, and burning of animals was for this purpose and was considered to be necessary for this purpose. Sacrifice as a means of cultivating communion with God also has relevance for us today. Like the ancient Jews, we Christians still have sacrifices, 
but of a different sort. No longer bloody animal sacrifices or burnt offerings, but the offering of the Eucharist as the great bloodless sacrifice, as well as many practices of Christian life that the Bible describes as sacrifices. We sacrifice our bodies through repentance and obedience, our possessions through charity, and our time, attention, and words through worship. Whereas ancient Jews sacrificed things external to themselves, animals and other material gifts, we sacrifice ourselves through these practices. And our sacrifices also involve a spiritual kind of slaughter. Just as the animal's life was ended, we must put to death our earthly members, as St. Paul says in the epistle to the Colossians. We must rend our souls with heartfelt examination and contrition. Psalm 50's sacrifice of the broken heart. We must pour out our lifeblood through selfless acts of charity. Following the admonition of the epistle to the Hebrews, do not forget to do good works and to share for God is well pleased with such sacrifices. All of these Christian practices involve some sense of suffering, some hardship. But rather than some self-imposed violence, they are focused on the goal of communion with God. They are necessary for that goal and are motivated by it. There is no other way to find a home with God except through sacrifice. Now there is another direction of interrelationship between sacrifice and communion. Just as sacrifice produces communion, so communion with God motivates additional sacrifice. This is not simply a path that is trodden once and then abandoned once the goal is achieved. Sacrifice is a perpetual companion to the communion we seek. At least in this life, it is. For communion with God is always a work in progress, an arena for spiritual growth. God willing, throughout our lives, we will grow ever deeper in communion with God as we continue to sacrifice day by day. The mother bird finds her home in the altar, then produces offspring for the sake of the altar. She maintains her home in that altar by providing offerings for it. Likewise, our experience of communion with God whets our appetite for greater communion and motivates us to make even greater sacrifices in order to reach even greater communion. While this is beautiful theology, we must admit that it is hard for us to relate to. This is because we don't have an intuitive grasp of the relational significance of sacrifices, whether it be the ancient ritual sacrifices or the modern spiritual sacrifices. All we see in the ancient rituals is the gruesome spectacle, killing, cutting, bloodletting, burning. So when we translate this symbolism to Christian practices, they strike us as a kind of senseless violence against ourselves. We also have trouble understanding a God who needs us to suffer in order to reach him, who is somehow pleased with our sufferings. Until the relational significance of sacrifice is restored, we will have difficulty grasping the psalm's image of the nest in the altar, the home found and maintained in sacrifice. And this will be our starting point for our next session. The